Welcome to RETN Roundtable, a program featuring discussions and dialogue on topics of community interest. On today's program, poetry and music collaboration with composer Eric Nielsen, poet David Budville, conductor Ann Decker, and RETN's David Cameron. Hello and welcome to RETN Roundtable. Today's program is going to be about a unique collaboration sponsored by the Vermont Youth Orchestra Association and it's going to involve music, poetry, and uh, some education along the way. And my guest to talk about our collaboration today is composer Eric Nielsen. Welcome back, Eric. Good to Thank see you. you again. And Ann Decker, who's the conductor of the Vermont Youth Philharmonia. Hi, Hi Ann. Thanks for joining us. And poet David Budville. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, when I heard uh, about the concert coming up in the Philharmonia and they were going to do a commission piece by Eric, um, you know, that got my interest and, and we agreed that we would tape and show that program. But then I heard that Eric was working on poems written by David Budville and it just piqued my interest on how we can take one form of art, and turn it into another, transfer it to the youngsters, the youth of the Philharmonia. So Anne, I'd like to start with you. I guess we should hear a little bit more about the Philharmonia. Okay. It's uh, one of the feeder orchestras for the Youth Orchestra Association. It's, um, we're finishing our fourth year, and um, they're, it's an auditioned group, full orchestra, and um, the students are placed after they are auditioned in one of the three full orchestras, and this is the the next one, mm -hmm. the one right before the top youth orchestra. Right. We're familiar with the youth orchestra mm -hmm. having taped their concerts for several years. Um, is, is it a younger age in Philharmonia? And, and as right. they develop, they move to the orchestra? Yeah, I would say the median age is younger. Um, a lot of the wind players tend to be similar ages as the youth orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll find the younger ages more in the string sections. And how long have you been with the, involved with the Philharmonia? With the Philharmonia specifically, this is my third year, um, my fourth year in Vermont and working with the okay. association. And before you came here, what were you doing? Uh, well, <laughs> I came here right out of grad school. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Michigan, um, did a conducting degree in Illinois, at Illinois State, and um, applied for this job, and it moved me to Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> to Vermont. And uh, before we started, we were discussing, but you, you also are involved in some opera production in New York City. Um, I did. I was involved with a company last spring uh -huh. for a production, yes. Great. Well, thanks. So I guess we'll, we'll go back, and, uh, and David, I'm going to talk to you a little bit. Um, we've actually taped you doing a reading from this book, right. and uh, that has been shown on the channel. And um, I, I'm going to assume that Eric I contact you at some point saying he was going to write a piece about your poetry. How, how did you and Eric get connected? Well, Eric and I have been connected for a, uh, a while because of the uh, libretto I wrote for his opera, our opera called A Fleeting Animal. So we hooked up uh, in the year two, 1998, 1998 yeah. probably, mm -hmm. and started working on the opera. So we've mm -hmm. been collaborating on words and music for a while. And then um, I don't remember how long ago, um, it was after this book came out, Moments came out in 99, um, he selected some poems and started uh, writing music for them, and then this opportunity came along, and there's how many? Four? Four, four, four poems. Uh, out of Moment to Moment that he's written music for. Okay. Um, have you heard any of the work? I haven't heard these, no. Okay, no, so it would be interesting. Yeah. Well, we'll get back to you, because as okay. we talk about this collaboration, it's going to be interesting as the poet and, and writer of these mm -hmm. pieces. Um, but Eric, let's, let's go to you. Um, we had talked to you before, and we were talking about you know, composing and how you take an idea and get it from your head to your hands onto paper. Um, now your idea is already on paper. Mm -hmm. what, what, how did it transpire? Were you reading the book and hearing music? or? Well, when um, David and I were collaborating on the opera A Fleeting Animal, he gave a reading from Moment to Moment, which had just been published. And um, 
of course, I had my hands full with his other words for the opera, but I was so impressed by the poems that I spoke to him and said, you know, when this is all over, this being the opera, I really would like to do some work with these shorter poems because I think they're wonderful. And he said, sure, fine. Um, and so that's how I was first acquainted with them. And I've since heard him read selections from moment to moment a number of times. And I found that's very helpful because when I was working specifically on this work, I had his cadence, his rhythm of right. reading the words. And so that helped to inform the way I approach them. Working with words, especially with specific poems, there is a structure in place already. And I think that one of my jobs as a composer is to take a look at that structure and honor it and respect it as much as possible in, in uh, setting those words to music. I don't want to go against what the poet is doing. I want, mm -hmm. if possible, to try and enhance through musical means um, the, the power and the lyricism that's already existing there in the, in the poems and give it a slightly different dimension. Right. A, a much different dimension, uh, one voice reading a poem to the many voices of, of an orchestra. An orchestra. I think of it sort of as an amplification in a lot okay. of ways. OK, good. That's good. Um, so you, you're hearing a poem, and, and one of the things, because poem as a meter, it's written in a, a meter or a, a, a tempo, or music would have that tempo. So hearing David read his poetry, it that gave me tempo an idea. Started. Well, it gave me an idea of his approach to his own words. And so sometimes when you look at words and they are out of the context of hearing a poet read them, you have to figure out whether the poet is being genuine, whether he or she is being ironic, whether there's humor involved. Mm -hmm. And and so when the poet reads it, then it becomes much clearer in that way. So that that was very helpful. But I also get an idea from reading them what my approach is. What, what are the main ideas of this poem? What are the things that I want to deal with here? And these are short enough poems so that I was able to make the statements fairly concise. OK. Well, David, I'm going to go back to you. Um, in, in writing poetry, um, you, do you start out with an idea and flesh that out? Or does the poem come to you? Uh, I think that for me, uh, it's usually, um, it starts with one of those um, aha experiences or what I call, um, when I talk about this, I, I, I talk about listening to or for the voices. I mean, if you hear too many voices, you end up <laughs> right. Get to be uh, institutionalized. <laughs> but I think um, um, uh, most poets, at least poets like myself, really do hear voices in, in, or, or a voice a line, a phrase uh, that gets something started. Right. And that's usually what happens with these things. They, uh, an image or a phrase comes to me from that mysterious yeah. elsewhere. Wherever, right. And, um, and that's what gets me started. And then once that's going and uh, I begin to expand on it, then um, and I have something down on paper, then that endless uh, revision process right. begins. Right, and having taped you, uh, I know that it, you and, me, and speaking with other poets, that it's always almost like a work in progress sometimes. Oh, you keep going yeah. back in a word here or there. We know Paul Valeray, the French poet, said a poem is never finished, it's only abandoned. <laughs> and, and I think that's a great way to put it because right. I'm, I'm working on, an, I'm finishing up a new manuscript uh, of poems now, and it's really. You finally say, I've, I've worked on that one, and I can't. I just have to stop and go on to the next one. Or it's time to quit fiddling with this and get on with it. Right. Yeah. Um, now, also, we know that you uh, uh, dabble in jazz and in right. music a bit. Um, yeah. Do you hear some music to your poetry when you're writing it? Or? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, um, I hear music a lot. Uh, I don't necessarily hear it in conjunction with the poems, but I do a lot of work with jazz musicians, especially uh, bassist William Parker and, and drummer, percussionist Tommy Drake, and, and uh, their rhythms, their cadences, their cadences, their music uh, affects the way I read poetry uh, totally. 
I mean, uh, right. the right. way you lay the line of words out across an improvised musical line uh, becomes the exciting part of, of collaborating with them. Well, yeah, that's great. So now we'll, we'll get back to local and, and the uh, Philharmonia. So, and, and were you told you were going to do this piece, or did you ask, you know, how did the relationship with Eric uh, start? Um, I, for a couple of years, I've been thinking about commissioning a piece, thought about, um, you know, kind of was searching in my mind about who to ask. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, in specifically, um, last spring, I believe, um, Troy mentioned that Eric had been in touch, Troy Peters, mm -hmm. um, with him about perhaps commissioning for the Philharmonia, and then put me in touch with Eric. And I, I thought it was a great idea. He was willing to do mm -hmm. it. And um, so it went from there. And uh, now I'm, I'm interested in the process of Eric getting his piece from his head to his hands, whatever, and then into the children via Anne, I'm assuming. And I say children, but the students right, who right. Are, are doing it. Is it different writing for adult performers than younger performers, or do you think about that as you're writing? Well, I think you have to consider um, what the specific conditions of the uh, birth of the work, so to speak, are going to be. And um, so first we discussed what sort of work would be nice. And Anne said, well, how about something that involves a soloist, maybe a professional soloist? Okay. And so I said, well, how about Wendy Hoffman Farrell? Because I had known Wendy singing and admired it. And I was really itching to write something <laughs> for her. And, and uh, Anne has worked with her also. And she said, great, let me ask her. And so Wendy was was willing. So that was so now I knew we would be doing a song cycle and so that made me think of, of David's work and I said, Aha, here's an opportunity uh, yeah, to use there these, is, there's that moment use these David poems. Was talking about, right. And um, then Anne came to me and said, Okay, let's talk about what things are going to happen. Now I know what the orchestra is going to be like because this was in the fall. Uh -huh. And she said, these are the sections that really need to be pushed. They need to be challenged because the players are really good. These are the sections where you need to be careful what you write because these students are not ready to play things that are terribly advanced. And so she gave me a very good breakdown of what I could and or ought not to do. <laughs> and um, I came to a rehearsal and made my own notes. I went over it with her. And then I had to factor that into my thinking about the piece. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to use that, what one of my composer friends calls it, a particular set of filters through which you work. Uh -huh. That is that you know that certain instruments you can really write a lot for and some others you want to be very conservative about and, and that informed how I approached the piece, along, of course, with trying to express musically the ideas in the poems. Well, and that to me is a challenge. That, that it you, is. You've worked with David in the, your opera. Were you involved also? I, I was. Okay. She was a music director. Oh, good. All right. Well, I'll make it easy now. We, We're all right. very we, close. We, That's we, right. We, literally <laughs> in the figure of the movie, right? Right. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, the, the, you hear David, Eric, you hear David doing it, you know, his poetry, and it's yes. inspired some music yes. in your head. And then now there's some filters here. So, yes. So there's a, a, the a creative inspiration yes. of hearing the word or, and reading the word. It's in, in your head, and now working with Anne, it's almost more tactile. I mean, yes. that element to it. Yes. I had asked David about poetry ever being finished. How about your work? Well, there are a lot of similarities. I mean, David is the sort of person, I've watched him work before, who when he's doing work for theater, will rewrite whole patches of dialogue to suit a particular actor or actress. I don't do that so much. I tend to try and get the work finished, and I sort of agonize over it beforehand mm -hmm. and try and get it so it's perfect, which of course is a vain hope. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing that is interesting about the process is I can set up a number of parameters about what I think should happen and where I think the poem is going to go, and I set up these things, you know, scales or harmonic language or whatever. And then sometimes what happens is it comes out kind of the way I'm planning. And sometimes, mm -hmm. like with the first poem, it ends up going in a direction that I had not anticipated at all. 
and I have to be open enough to say, oh, okay, this is where it wants to go. I think of the work as a living organism, right. okay. and I get to a certain point in it, and it tells me what it needs, you know, and that, that I try and follow it then to the end. It's sort of like Michelangelo saying that there's a sculpture in every block of marble. His right. job was just to, to chip away the thing so he could find it. Well, and a little bit of jazz, of course, is letting that piece take you where it's going to Yeah, go. a little bit more than a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, uh, and so it's, it's interesting to hear some of that. So Anne, having worked with, with both these folks, um, I, I'm interested in how Eric presented the piece to you. I mean, on a piece of paper, on a cassette, was it piano? Mm -hmm. And then your process of helping interpret that piece for your players, your okay. winds and strings. Okay. Um, well, the piece was presented to me on paper in a score, and I take the score and um, analyze it. Then um, I started with the poetry, and um, which I think is appropriate, as I assume Eric did as well. And I get to know the poetry, find out, okay, what did Eric see in this line, and what did he do to enhance that poetry there? So. I, I need to come to a place where I really understand musically how they're related, um, besides all of the just great musical ideas that I need to internalize and, mm -hmm. and learn. So when I took it to the first rehearsal, I passed out the poems, and we all read through the poetry okay. and uh, with the students. Mm -hmm. That's how we started. And I knew we wouldn't have Wendy in a rehearsal for quite a few weeks. We wanted to get it to a point that we could uh, be really productive when she got there. Um, so that's how I started. We went through rehearsals. And then at a few weeks ago, um, perhaps it was right before Wendy did her first rehearsal, I approached Eric and I said, you know, could we get together? and?" And I could just ask you a few questions, and maybe you could tell me a little information that might open up something else for me as well. So we we met over coffee or tea or something, and um, just talked through the pieces. And I asked, "Well, did you do this here because of this?" and and asked for any other information. So that's another way, a wonderful way that I can learn great. about the piece. It was great. So, it true great. collaboration. Um, working with, obviously, you know, a living composer who is somewhat close <laughs> a by. A few miles away. Yeah, uh, <laughs> as opposed to taking a Beethoven piece or something that you may have heard other right. people's interpretations. Yeah. So, uh, again, some collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to switch to Eric a little bit. Did you go back to David for more inspiration or insight, or did you kind of go from your original and work that? I did not go back to David, although um, I would not have hesitated had I been at a place where there was something that I wasn't getting from the poetry. I would not have hesitated to call David because he and I have worked together really well before, and so I feel very close to him in a lot of ways. And so I wouldn't have had a problem doing that, but I didn't happen to in this case. Okay. And Anne will pick on you a second. but. Um, you know, starting something new but familial because you had worked in the past. When you started this thinking, were you thinking in terms of what you did and it was what you now have different? You know? I'm not sure what, Well, in after working, I talked with Eric. Right, ap, you know, you had worked on Drew Divine. Oh, okay, oh, okay, so going back to the done, opera, okay. And now Eric is going to do a new piece and mm -hmm. it's based on David. So. Mm -hmm. Your expectation of maybe what was going to come, what was it? Um, I knew it would be great. <laughs> that's, that's what I knew, I think. <laughs> well, and, and let me, I guess I can back up because we mentioned Wendy a couple times. But Wendy Hoffman Trails, right. a soprano, operatic mm -hmm. singer, who will, I'm going to make a wild assumption, but sing the words <laughs> to correct of assumption. David's poetry. Um, so we're bringing some opera. To, to this piece. Is it different from what you did in Judah Vine? It's, it's different in that it is not staged. It is not something that is overtly acted. So this is more um, like a dramatic song cycle. I mean, it's, uh -huh. uh, she's, she's singing it, and she's interpreting it, and 
she and I talked about certain approaches to things. Um, but I've seen Wendy do other singing than opera, so I know that it is, you know, that she's very good at whatever right. she does. And so I wasn't thinking of this as being particularly operatic, just something that would suit her in her yeah. work with orchestra. And there's a long history of sopranos singing with an orchestra or a quartet or... Right. Yeah. Yes, things. of course. Uh, and I do have to point out, in fairness to Wendy, <laughs> that she's actually a mezzo-soprano. She uh, started as a soprano, but um, when people call her a, a soprano, she um, would rather be called a mezzo, mezzo because that's what she really okay. is. Well, well Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we've cleared that up. And uh, actually, uh, we will be taping the performance, and viewers will be able to... Uh, see Wendy and all the students in, in the Philharmonia. Um, working with students, Anne, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have their skill level. Right. And I'm sure quite varied at, at that age that you're working with. Do you find that you may, as a conductor, change some work a little, knowing the levels of the students? Or were you able to work with Eric and have him Oh, that, the beauty of this collaboration, I mean, from a conducting to composition standpoint is, as he said already, I, I was very specific in terms of this commission and um, the strengths and what I'd like featured mm -hmm. in the orchestra. Um, it, yeah, I could be very specific because I, um, we talked about this in the fall. Mm -hmm. I had already had a concert with the kids. I knew their... Yeah, I knew where the strengths were and uh, what could um, really be celebrated in that, in the ensemble. So I could be really specific, down to instrumentation. And you mentioned earlier that uh, you wanted to challenge, mm -hmm. maybe, and, and that's your role as a conductor in a youth right. or orchestra or youth organization, is challenging these kids to grow. Right, and, and being specific to certain levels is really accept, you know, an exceptional opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, if a certain, that we have a soloist, a cello solo um, in the piece, and he just stands out in the ensemble, and so that came to my attention right away. You know, Eric, if we could really show this guy off, that would be special. So, so. you asked for a... Yeah. For a cello solo. Well, I, I told him how yeah, that's great. what yeah, a great yeah, player yeah, he was, yeah. and he w great. wrote a beautiful solo. And Daniel is just, it's a gorgeous. Yeah. This section. sounds like the perfect way yeah. to make it music. Is. <laughs> it is. Uh, you know, that's, that's uh, great. it's very good. Um, David, um, our time is starting to wind down a little bit. I did want to ask you, you know, as a writer, mm -hmm. uh, a poet, uh, you've seen your work. But now to see, say, Drew Devine as a play, as an opera, uh, I'm not sure if, if there's other pieces of music. How do you feel, you know, as a writer, seeing someone else's interpretation of mm. that? Well, I, I, I'm sure there's, uh, there's interpretations out there that I, I wouldn't like. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen productions of Drew Devine that I'm not that crazy about around the country. But, uh, but generally speaking, uh, they're just a fascination to me. I have an avant-garde jazz. Right. Piano player friend in, in New York who um, s uh, composed some music for a little poem uh, that I wrote last year. Um, Eric has done all these uh, little poems that um, um, for more classical uh, oriented uh, ensembles. Um, and and I, I'm just fascinated to see what other people see in, right. in the material. Right. Yeah. And see it come back. Yeah. Well, we are definitely running out of time, so I want to thank all three of you for taking the time to chat with us, and t thank all three of you for taking the time to collaborate on this. Yeah. It's just great. Our pleasure. Yeah. It's, it's great. great for us to have the opportunity to share behind the scenes, which mm -hmm. is, is a, a, you know, in television production, I get to see behind the scenes, and sometimes I'm disappointed with the final <laughs> program because <laughs> I've seen all the work that, that yeah. happened there. Right. So um, thanks once again, and I'll remind our viewers that uh, they'll be able to see the piece, which is Reflections on the Way, Songs of a Hermit, uh, and uh, uh, others on the mm -hmm. screen from our concert coming up. And uh, you can visit our website, www.retn.org, for a complete schedule and more information. Thank you very much for watching, and stay tuned for future programs. Thank you. 
If you have any comments on today's program, or if you have ideas for future roundtable programs, please contact us. 